and why was that a priority, right? And that kind of is really to address these specific points. And then, um, and then we're you know also talking not just with individuals, but say like plans like here you have the Tim Works plan, uh, flood production plan, and how and Hokeman, and uh, say they might be somebody we might want to talk to about how they develop their adaptation priorities and how other people can learn from that. All right. Next step from that would be connect with those influential people uh, that we that I mentioned. Uh, so bring our toolkit drafts to them and say, does this meet your needs? If you are potentially going to be adapting, if you are going to be advocating for adaption, either way. Um, and so that's really, um, really where we're going to learn from people who might be might stand to benefit from this information. And then we'll come back and, and say, does this work? Does this work? Does that work? And really, perhaps have a workshop with those individuals or organizations to make sure that it, that the information is in the right hands and the information is crafted correctly for them. So the point there is like, who are those people, right? That's that's what I'm asking, and that's kind of one thing I'm hoping maybe uh, maybe. Uh, could be um, uh, what, something we learned from the group here is um, like so you know here you have the Alder Mill in uh, in South Bend or a picture from that uh, and then uh, the Shoalwater Bay Casino the uh, Westport Marina right What's, what do these have in common well they're all on the shores they all employ a lot of people or at least are really tightly connected to um, to the economies in the area and they also so they all may stand to benefit from this information I haven't reached out to any of these people yet actually so. The idea is these are potential people to reach out to though and see if they could use this information and how they might be able to um, how they might be able to inform what the best ways are to adapt and then share that information because they're influential organizations. Um, so uh, so the idea here is you know who who are these people? And if uh, if if I could co-opt a piece of the uh, the whiteboards over there that Doug mentioned. Um, maybe on the uh, bottom right side, if people have any ideas of business owners, individuals who might be building a home, um, people who just are in a position that they might be interested in learning more about sea level rise and how uh, they could better adapt, right? Like what those actual projections are. And then uh, please put their name and contact info or, or anything that you think could help us there or just speak to me individually during one of the breaks or lunch. Um, but um, so community groups as well, homeowners, and these are people that also might be people in the green resource committees, right? Say if Doug wants to say, oh yeah, I'm interested in this, and I'm wanting to advocate for sea level rise planning. Okay, cool. Uh, how can I learn more about this so I can better do so? And then that's another name that you know we're hoping to get to. So the idea really here is just uh, to try to figure out better ways to get information in the right hands to uh, to, to put legs under the data. So it's really um. It's really more about what happens after we produce the projections than it is about the projections themselves. But also it's about what y'all know and, and collaborating with people who live in the shores of Washington to figure out what are the best ways to move forward. Um, so I'll say thank you, uh, first and foremost, to everyone for bearing through with technical difficulties. And um, you know, uh, like I said, thanks for letting uh, sea level rise be an icebreaker meeting all y'all. Um, the, um, the, and the whole thing is, um, yeah, I think, um, I think it's a good project that's going to move forward and I look forward to any questions anybody has. I know we might be running short on time to move into the next presentation, but, um, okay, perfect, cool. Well, if anybody has any questions real quick, um, yeah. You're going to be here all day, though, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Come at if me. you have questions for Jackson, feel free to catch him at a break or lunchtime or something. Just another little announcement. Uh, we really don't like leftovers. So I know a lot of people don't like to take it. feel like you've already had a little bit and you want to look at the page or something. Take away. So I want to make another plug again for the bulletin board that Jackson mentioned. Um, this is a new item for us, and what I hope is that people who want to propagate their own contacts will put them up. People who want to add to, to Jackson's information will put stuff on the bulletin board. And again, this information is going to be accessible to anybody who has a smartphone. Um, our next speaker is Andy Appleby from the Hatchery Science Review Board.
He's worked many years at the state working on hatcheries and uh, science. Um, we have we've had some contentious issues in in Willapa Bay regarding hatcheries um, and the state. And Andy's going to give us a little bit of the history of hatchery stuff. And I there are a couple of different narratives about this um, as to whether the science of hatcheries works or not. But Andy's going to enlighten us. Well, uh, good morning. As Doug said, I am Andy Appleby. I'm currently a co-chair of the Hatchery Scientific Review Group. I spent 32 years with the Washington Department of Fisheries at the time I started, now Fish and Wildlife, uh, as a hatchery biologist. I've been associated with the Hatchery Scientific Review Group since 2003. And I've been uh, co-chair since uh, 2012. Uh, I'd like to make this fairly interactive. I have a little bit of sort of technical stuff to talk about. Uh, if you got a, if if I've lost you or you have a question, feel free to stop me. Uh, Doug will get the hook out and drag me off uh, if I exceed my time. As I always say, nobody likes to hear themselves talk more than I do. Uh, so I tend to get on a roll and take a bunch of little bird walks uh, as things come to my mind. So as long as we can stay within some reasonable time constraint, I'd love this to be kind of a back and forth if, if you have some questions. The other thing I want to hit is that your agenda says the history of, of hatchery reform, and that's what Doug and I first agreed to. As I got into the uh, drafting my presentation, I thought, you know, you deserve much more than that. So while I, I will cover the history of hatchery reform, I'm also going to give you uh, hatchery reform 101 and uh, talk about a couple of other things. So speaking of that, we're going to talk about the history. Uh, what is hatchery reform? We're going to talk about the history of it. We're going to review the basic framework of hatchery reform, what, what it is we actually do and talk about. And then finally, uh, a section here that's actually sort of near and dear to my heart is why are we even implementing hatchery reform? What's, what's the point of it all? This is what hatchery reform is actually. Systematic, science-driven review of hatchery programs to achieve two goals. Helping conserve natural spawning populations, that's obvious, but what most people maybe don't hear all the time is support sustainable fisheries both recreational fisheries and commercial fisheries. Uh, current list of folks, I don't expect you to have, a, have the chance to memorize these. The only thing I want to point out from this chart is that we have a wide diversity of representation on the HSRG. Uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oregon, Idaho, uh, Yakima, Northwest Indian Fish Commission, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and then we have quite a suite of unaffiliated folks. Uh, in our bylaws, it, uh, it says that we are, we're coming here as independent scientists. So even though you may work at the Department of Fish and Wildlife, when you come to one of our meetings, come to one of our discussions, we expect you to act as an independent scientist. You don't bring the agency's policy on something and try to lobby for that. We're really about the science behind uh, uh, hatchery fish, natural fish, the interaction that takes place with those. Principles, clear goals. This is a story I tell on myself. Uh, when I, in 1978, when I first started as a hatchery biologist, I was told that the goals of our hatchery program were to contribute fish to the Northeast Pacific fishery. Well, and that sounded great at the time, but as we worked through the hatchery reform idea, we have decided that, you know, to justify hatchery programs, you need to be a lot more specific than that. Because the Eastern Pacific is a pretty big area, right? And if you're, are you, do you want to contribute one fish to that fishery? Do you want to contribute a hundred fish to that fishery? So we encourage hatchery managers and harvest managers to think very carefully about 
what exactly you're trying to accomplish with a hatchery. Scientific defensibility is important for us, uh, uh, which is why we try very hard to act as independent scientists uh, and have a knowledge of what the current literature in the scientific community states about the interaction of hatchery and wild fish. And finally, informed decision making, otherwise known as adaptive management. Uh, you may have some ideas of the scientific defensibility, you may have some ideas of the goals, but uh, the best laid plans, right, don't always work out. So if something doesn't appear to be working, you should have the flexibility, you should have, have the understanding to say, you know what, this is what we thought was going to happen, but this isn't what's happening. So we need to be able to adjust that. Four H's that are uh, involved in the decline of salmon. I think most people are familiar with, with that. HSRG and hatchery reform is all about solving the hatchery H. That's really what our prime <laughs> objective was. Uh, it's really about, it was really initially about saving hatcheries. And I, I'll talk a little more about that later, but those of you that have been following the scientific literature know that in the late 90s there began to be more and more evidence that hatchery fish have a negative impact on wild fish. Along with harvest, along with habitat, along with hydro, that's where the four H's came from. Uh, so hatchery reform is, is about addressing this H, re relates to reducing the hatchery fish on the spawning ground, which is how you reduce the impact that hatchery fish have. But along with that, we, we've gotten more and more into harvest, and that is to say that because of, as we've analyzed hatcheries, as we've analyzed uh, how best they can be maintained, selective fishing has come up with a way uh, in our minds of saying there's an awful lot of fish that can be caught, an awful lot of fish that need to be caught from a conservation standpoint, uh, so that in, in fact you, you can maintain the benefits of hatcheries while still reducing the negative impacts that they have on natural origin fish. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, again, and Finally, what, what has, has come to us in some of our uh, uh, study is that, you know, for habitat improvement, we, we believe that you're much better off put, putting a fish that's locally adapted, that's adapted to the existing habitat, if you open up new habitat or you revitalize habitat, putting a fish that's much more fit, that's much better able to utilize that habitat into that new area gets you a lot more benefits faster. So a brief history, uh, 1999 actually it was uh, Norm Dix in the House and Slade Gordon in the Senate uh, that got together and in the face of this scientific literature that was showing how the hatcheries were having a negative impact and, you'll re and if, for those of you that aren't familiar, this is the timeline just after Puget Sound Chinook were listed, Columbia River Chinook were listed, uh, Redfish Lake Sockeye were listed. A lot of salmon populations on the, in Washington and Oregon were beginning to be listed under ESA. Ha because it had been identified in the scientific literature that hatcheries uh, can have a negative impact, the real question was, should we keep having hatcheries? Maybe the best solution would be to close down the hatcheries in the Pacific Northwest. Well, that's, that certainly would reduce the impacts, but it would also dramatically reduce the benefits, right? And, and so that was really the question put to the science advisory team. Can we still have hatcheries to get the benefits in the face, in the face of ESA? Uh, Congress provided funding uh, in 2004. The Puget Sound Coastal Review was complete. 2005, the initial version of AHA was developed. Uh, AHA is the all H analyzer. That's the model we use, the tool we use to analyze individual hatchery programs. Uh, 2009, we did uh, the Columbia River Basin all 365 hatchery programs. It actually took us about two and a half years to, to do that. 
Uh, those reports are all done. A little more recently, in 2012, we did a detailed review of the Elwha Chinook HGMP uh, 2014 report to Congress. We have a paper on the science of hatcheries. Uh, and 2015 to 2017, we updated our uh, principles. We did a bunch of training uh, for WDF and W, and we've developed some more advanced versions of our model. So the point I'm trying to show you here is that is that there, we, we've been around for a while and we've been actively involved at various levels uh, because we're scientists, because we believe in, in reviewing our own uh, theories, uh, that's, why, that's why you see updates to, to uh, uh, some of our ideas here, is that new science is presented. I want to point out, it's not science that we do. Okay, we, we don't conduct research. But what we, because we have a, a large group of folks with a variety of expertise, from genetics to <coughs> ecology to hatcheries, uh, we strive, try to stay knowledgeable of the very current research that's going on and the very current results that we're reading about. So every couple of years, we sort of do an inventory of what papers have come out in the last couple of years, and does that tell us anything different about some of our theories and some of our ideas, ideas and should some of our recommendations be modified because of new science. So you got to understand that it's a progress, right? Uh, uh, is that the, and the more we learn, the more you can expect that we'll uh, sort of look back and say, is, here's some new science. How does that affect our, our thinking? That's the adaptive management piece. Uh, some examples of, of implementation or discussion of HSRG principles. Uh, if we're getting kind of out there now. Most people that deal in the fish world have heard of us, have, know something about the work that we have been proposing uh, and the ideas. Uh, 2009, 10, I won't go through each one of these. but. These are fairly significant documents that have come out by uh, either U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or NOAA or the Independent Science Review Panel, that's the ISRP and on the Columbia River, who have looked at these documents and, and made connections between what the HSRG has said about these programs and, and what's in the final document. So. All right, so cornerstones here, rootstock management, population designations, compliance with environmental regulations. So this is your, now we're moving into HSRG 101. Let's talk about rootstock management. I better get a little drink of water here. This is the fun part for me. What is really the issue with hatchery fish? The issue is something that the geneticists call domestication. Now that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we're making, we're taking, we're taking buffalo and making cows or we're making pets out of hatchery fish. But what it does mean is that fish, almost any animal, will adapt over time to the environment it finds itself in. That's a pretty solid uh, concept in the world of conservation biology. And as a matter of fact, particularly with salmon, who, who we not, now know are really good at adapting rapidly to different environments. And when you think about it, that's actually been a huge benefit to salmon because as their habitat has changed over, over thousands of years because of floods or glaciers or uh, uh, all kinds of different things, they need to be really good at becoming adapted quickly to a new environment. Well, when you put fish in a hatchery, that's a different environment for at least part of their life, right? Living conditions are different, and so consequently, the theories in, in, uh, in the, what the geneticists believe is that those fish will become really good hatchery fish. And what I tell hatchery managers is don't, don't think that you're making bad wild fish. 
What you're making is really good hatchery fish. I, I question some of the reading that I have done has kind of looked at whether hatcheries can produce fish that are more fit. Um, paper out of California, the recent one out of DC, they're using that genetic genes and stuff. And that is kind of a little bit different in the sense of looking at hatchery fish as, as diminishing the fitness of the natural fish. Because if you can produce hatchery fish that are more fit in the first place, you can kind of bridge that gap. Right. Any comments on that? And, well, this, that's actually the whole theory behind hatchery reform. How we propose to do it is managing the gene flow, which I'm going to talk about in some, some detail. But the end result is exactly this, that. The end result is to have a fish that isn't quite such a good hatchery fish. It's actually uh, a lot better wild fish. And we do that by, by controlling the gene flow, which again, I'm going to get into. The bottom line is, and, and you know what? This, here's the thing you need to understand about salmon. Wild fish in this stream, and, and this has been proven any number of times by transferring groups of fish back and forth, transferring groups of fish between hatcheries. When you move hatchery, uh, hatchery fish from this hatchery over to this hatchery and turn them loose, they don't do as well as the hatchery fish that were raised and released from that hatchery. Uh, when you move wild fish from one system to another, they don't do as well as those fish that were born and raised. Uh, this is why we believe that, and again, I don't, what I'm trying to avoid here, it, because I read it in the popular press a lot, I'm trying to avoid this idea that somehow these are bad fish. These fish are just doing what they're naturally inclined to do, and that is to get real good at living in the environment that they found themselves in. As a matter of fact, it's almost, it would be almost impossible to keep them from doing it because that's, that's how they've made a living for millions of years, is finding themselves in, in a environment and quickly adapting to that environment. I'll give you some examples in just a minute. But the bottom line is, this is what you have, we have to acknowledge, the bottom line is that fish that's well adapted to the hatchery, turns out that a lot of those traits that make it real good hatchery fish hurt it when that fish spawns in the wild. Hurt the offspring of that fish if it mates with a wild fish. So that, that's, how, that's the whole concept right there. Any questions there? Yes, sir. What traits are particularly problematic? Which traits are problematic? I'm going to get to that. That's my next slide. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my understanding with steelhead that it's an aggressive male uh, native steelhead wants to breed with the spawning female hatchery fish. It's not the, the other way around. So it's actually, it's not the hatchery fish who are trying to mix with the wild. It's the wild that are mixing with the... Well, I, you know, you can, put the motiv motiv you can put whatever motivation you want on the males, uh, uh, but the bottom line is you're right in the sense that the studies that have been done in the Yakimos, the studies that, that have been done in other places, in the Olympic Peninsula, female hatchery fish have a lot higher success spawning in the wild than male hatchery fish do. Okay? That's going to get to your question uh, here. Bottom line is we're trying to, we're trying to preserve the, the, the fitness of the natural fish and, be, and by manipulating the gene flow, we're trying to make sure that the hatchery fish have at least some of that. So what is it we're talking about? Question here, question here. Fitness, <laughs> fitness optima in two environments. This, uh, by that I mean what's a good trait in this environment versus a good trait in that environment. Bottom, at the bottom you see here uh, phenotypic values. A phenotypic trait is any trait you can see or measure. Okay, fecundity, age at maturity, size at maturity, those are all phenotypic traits, the scientists would call. So let's talk about a few traits. Let's talk about uh, age at maturity. Uh, how different, in, in, any advantage in the, uh, in the hatchery versus the wild? 
Well, not really, frankly, because the older you are as a salmon, the more likely you're going to get caught and not be able to come back and spawn, right? The more years you spend out in the ocean with fishery after fishery after fishery, the less likely you're going to come back. So it's actually a selective advantage in either environment to come back earlier rather than, than later. Now that's an artifact of what we have done, our, our management strategy. That's not natural. But let's talk about uh, aggressiveness. Okay, uh, male aggressiveness in terms of, of uh, securing a female. Well, there's a big advantage in the natural environment if you're a male to have genes that make you really aggressive because you're much more likely to spawn successfully. Is there any advantage to being an aggressive male in, in the hatchery environment? No. Because that, has, that plays no role in whether or not you're going to spawn. What plays a role is whether the hatchery person has grabbed you by the tail and bonked you on the head. That's what determines whether you're going to spawn or not. A female's ability to select a red site. Okay? Oh, absolutely. That makes sense. In, in the natural environment, it selects for females that, that pick the best spot to to lay their eggs, right? That makes sense. Does that make any difference in, in a hatchery environment? Absolutely not. The point I'm trying to make here is that you can see that over generations, different traits are going to be selected for or against in the two environments. The one I really like to talk about is uh, ability to tolerate crowding, con crowded conditions as a juvenile. Hugely selected for in a hatchery. Why? Because you're in a rearing pond. Much higher densities than found naturally. And if you don't have much innate ability to tolerate that stress, you're going to get sick and die. And not going to do very well. So, we've got two strategies, two ways of managing brood stock to help control this gene flow. And they're very simple to tell apart. Integrated brood stocks. You, you only have to ask yourself one question. Do you either accidentally or, in, or on purpose include natural origin fish in your hatchery brood stock? If the answer is yes, then by our definition, you have an integrated program. Segregated brood stock. If you either on purpose or purposely exclude natural origin fish, you have a segregated brood stock program. And the reason it's important to define that, uh, which I hope will become obvious to you, is that it sort of takes you down two different paths for how you're going to manage your hatchery fish. And frankly, the tolerance for risk that you have with the two different hatchery fish. In an integrated program, you have gene flow between the hatchery and the natural populations. That's what you're trying to accomplish, is some gene flow. In the segregated program, much like our chamber steelhead programs have been run for years and years, the point is to keep those two populations totally separate. Don't want them to mix. Okay? So, we got one, we basically have one big gene pool here, on the segregated side, we have two gene pools. Clear? Is that clear? Because it's going to be critical to get that as we go through here. Let me deal with segregated programs because they're the easiest. Create a new hatchery adapted population. And I look, that's, there's no better evidence than that than the Chambers Creek population, right? They, 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 they spawn three or four months earlier than the natural counterpart. The whole point of that, of developing that brood stock, which was the reason it's called Chambers Creek, is it was done up in Chambers Creek in Puget Sound in the uh, late 40s, early 50s. They selectively bred early returning fish that spawned earlier so that they had a population that was way different than the natural environment, natural fish. However, because of that difference, they may pose a significant genetic or ecological risk to natural spawning populations. All right? Most appropriate when there's a low probability of hatchery fish spawning with natural populations, 
uh, producing fish where spawning habitat no longer exists. I'm thinking Cowlitz, I'm thinking Lewis, uh, I'm thinking any of the hydro Im 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 impacted rivers. Uh, or where smoke releases and adult collection facilities are physically separated from natural spawning areas. Uh, you might think Young's Bay, you might think uh, Deep River Neptunes. Uh, some place where when the fish come back, there isn't an important natural population nearby that you're trying to preserve. A lot of uses for segregated. They're not, they're not bad, it's just a different strategy. Okay, now here's the theory behind integrated and it gets a little more complicated here.